Along with you and the other 8 billion people alive now on this planet, we are living with climate change and coastal change here in Maine. The Gulf of Maine has been warming faster than nearly every body of water on the planet, scientists have found, and that's disrupting everything from clam fisheries to sea levels even faster than the global average. This is a tidal inlet. Local tides rise and fall about three meters on average. Occasional king tides take that up close to four meters. Add a wicked storm surge to a king high tide, and you're probably looking at the average sea level later in the century. That's what happened here on December 24th. The worst is definitely yet to come. 75 mile an hour gusts tonight. So far it's just been a gale. But a king high tide, 13 feet, which is two feet above sort of the average high tide. Makes things way worse. That high tide storm was essentially a time machine. Given what's coming, we are almost assuredly not rebuilding the dock. The fringing salt marsh will be better for it as well. But I embraced buying our home, which is five meters above the average high tide, despite knowing seas are rising and will be doing so for many centuries to come, despite knowing that Greenland and Antarctic glaciers show signs of instability. After 35 years on the climate change beat, including literally dozens of interviews over decades with the best experts on ocean change and climate change. My bet is that this funky cottage built of local logs in the 1970s will be fine through 2070 or so, at least. At that point, our sons can raise it, move it, or move on. Of course, that's a privileged position to be in. Around the world, I've reported for decades from places where the capacity to deal with climate hazards is vastly more limited. Kenya, India, Maldives, the Amazon, actually coastal Louisiana. So what policies and personal choices can help as many people as possible live with climate change? What can we do to help societies build a sustainable relationship with climate and coasts, energy and ecosystems, and each other? There are two main tracks. Cut local climate vulnerability by spreading the capacity to adapt to those most in harm's way. Slow the pace of global climate change by cutting CO2 and the rest of the greenhouse gases. We know how to do both, of course. It was all in articles I've written since literally 1988 and in every IPCC report from then forward. But as Connie Hedegaard will explore later in the meeting, we know we're good at setting targets and less good at achieving them. That's kind of an understatement. She'll be exploring whether we can manage our systems, organizations, and behavior as fast as is needed. What to do? To me, the answer is uh, we'll never change as fast as needed. And that's not a failure. It's just being human. Our capacity to harness energy in ways that change the climate built far faster than our capacity to understand the full implications and pathways out of this bind. What would be a failure is not to wake each day and try to make progress. It can be depressing, even paralyzing, to see targets come and go. A decade ago, I began a Twitter string when I fully recognized the limits of numbers, targets, 2 degrees, 1.5, 350, you name it. And what I came out with as I grappled with that question, what do you do, what do you work on? I found then and now the best way past that sense of paralysis is to pick apart the complexity monster called the climate crisis or climate emergency. Those terms are way too vague and vast to be meaningful. Pick them apart. Use a tool that the best journalists have employed for generations, the question mark. When someone shouts climate emergency, ask who is in a state of emergency? Why? What are the drivers of risk? What factors can be addressed to reduce harm and loss? For every climate threat, there's a set of answers and a job to do. Take heat just as an example. The world faces growing zones of truly dangerous heat waves uh, beyond uh, modern experience, beyond survivability according to some basic physiological calculations. Uh, I interviewed Christy Ebai at the University of Washington, who's one of the world's leaders on climate and health and heat. And she has said to me over and over this, nobody needs to die in a heat wave. Listen to her. 
there has been, for very good reasons, a primary focus on mitigation, reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. We have to adapt. People are suffering and dying right now from climate change, including from heat. All of those deaths are potentially preventable. Nobody needs to die in a heat wave. So the people who are suffering and dying right now, if we had really good heat action plans, if we were taking steps to help protect these people, we could reduce morbidity and mortality right now. And as you've written about so much, Andy, the future is in our hands. The temperatures we're going to see in the next couple of decades depend on our actions, on what we do, what we do individually and collectively to reduce our emissions. What she has laid out is the importance of developing a heat plan, looking around your community, down the street from you, who doesn't have an air conditioner? Where are the elderly people who are not on the internet who uh, need to be alerted when uh, extreme heat is building? There are action points all around. The same for floods, the same for storms. We can do huge amounts of resilience building at the local level. And then at the global level, of course, organizations and institutions, academia, where I sit part of the time, have huge amount of responsibility for making sure that information is available in a timely fashion and in fashion in ways that fit the local ecosystem of, of action. You know, who needs to know when the flood is coming? How do you make that case? How do you make sure the right media are involved? Those are questions beyond the traditional forms of journalism that I grew up with. And they're all part of how we get through this process toward a, a more resilient world that is living with climate change, even as we're working to slow climate change. The carbon problem is the ultimate problem, and it's going to take time. There are many countries in this planet, communities that are under energized, for whom it's immoral for the rich world to say to Ghana or Mozambique, you can't have your fossil fuels when we've developed all of our wealth and technology and uh, advancement using them for more than a century. Uh, finding ways to accommodate growth in some fossil fuel use where it's needed, where it's the only option, uh, is part of the answer to the climate problem. It seems hard to figure that out sometimes, but it's really true. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the things you have to live with to live with climate change is living with contradiction. Uh, not everyone will be on the same plan, the same timetable. The tide is rising fast behind me. It's one of those king tides, luckily not with a storm. Along with the question mark, I'd love to offer one more tool and tactic that I found invaluable in cutting to the core of a climate challenge. Try substituting the phrase climate risk for climate change every time it comes up in a conversation, a speech, in your own mind about the challenge you face. Climate change, meaning changes in hazards like storms and heat waves linked to rising greenhouse gases, is just one driver of the climate risk facing a community. But societal conditions, inequity, marginalization, exclusion from decision-making are far bigger factors still and more addressable on short time scales. This is all in the IPCC reports, the working group too. I'll never forget the fantastic distillation of this idea offered by the great climate-focused geographer, Diana Liverman, who recently retired at the University of Arizona after decades of groundbreaking research and service on IPCC reports. When we talk about climate risk, some people still just think, oh, it's the probability of a heat wave, but we need right. to think about risk, not as the probability of the heat wave, but as the probability of harm. In addition to sort of population growth, um, and uh, other factors, poverty is massively important in explaining right. And we see a lot of parts of the world, even though we've brought you know, millions of people out of poverty, um, that there are parts of the world where aspects of poverty make people very vulnerable. So you know, the work we've done in uh, Mexico and in other regions shows that if you're poor and they privatize your water, it makes you more vulnerable. If you're an indigenous community and somebody steals your land, you're vulnerable. There are so many ways in which addressing basic social welfare can reduce vulnerability, whether it's in New Orleans or Mexico City. 
Of course, identifying climate vulnerability is just the first step to eliminating it. That requires a commitment in people at every level to working in a sustained way to overcome long-standing injustices and institutional barriers to spreading resilience to all. There's a lot of inertia out there. This is where a personal stock taking comes in handy. What are your skills and passions? Are you an artist, engineer, journalist, electrician, teacher? What gaps can you fill by building networks, reaching out to others with other skills if you can't do it all yourself and you can't? Focus on identifying hotspots of vulnerability down the block or around the world. The internet makes that possible. Or energy opportunity, the same. From the United States with our trillion dollars now close in opportunity money, there's tons to do. And then dive in at whatever scale suits you best to make incremental but measurable progress. Individual action has been much derided of late by those correctly noting that industries dead set on maintaining the fossil fuel status quo tried for decades to sell us the narrative that everything from litter to global warming is not their fault. Individual action has been attacked by others correctly because we all know that what is needed is system change, not light bulb change. But what is the path to system change? A transformative movement starts through a thousand dispersed individual experiments campaigns and tests on the ground, some in courtrooms. Go to ourchildrenstrust.org for one. Some technological. Look at myheat.ca for an interesting visualization of energy change in neighborhoods. Some social. Yes, including protests like Fridays for the Future, Fridays for Future. Some educational. Go on a boiler room tour. Google for boiler room tour and my name. Some legislative. The Green New Deal had its flaws, but the great ideas in it live on as a framework for equitable and systematic climate action. And I do think communication experiments can play a role. The first 20 years of my global warming reporting from 1988 through 2007 were mostly explanatory science and policy journalism. Me, the reporter, telling stories to you, the audience, using a widening array of tools. It was really cool and fun. But what happened in the meantime? A lot of emissions. Hundreds of journalists have migrated to the climate beat, and many are doing essential and innovative work. But I wouldn't count on news coverage tipping some balance, and not just because fossil fuelers have dumped hundreds of millions of dollars into ad campaigns and to buying political influence. Media, particularly in the instant age, are simply not well set up to address wicked problems like this one. Great reporting is still happening. You'll hear about that in the uh, workshop. But overall, I see the greatest potential for communication impact in moving from telling a better story, my stock in trade for decades, to fostering more productive conversations and connectedness, connecting all those change makers distributed across the world to make a difference. This can occur within communities to foster resilience and clean energy access, and between communities to share successes and failures. That's where social media really can matter, no matter what Elon Musk does. Two examples that excite me that you can Google for, again, the hashtag Skype a scientist. Back in the day when Skype was the thing instead of Zoom. But it still lives on. It's a way for scientists to connect with communities, with educators, libraries, uh, other groups. ThrivingEarthExchange.org is an innovative effort by the American Geophysical Union to connect hydrologists, geologists, other earth scientists and atmospheric scientists with communities facing challenges. Finally, some concluding thoughts. There's something about facing a climate challenge that's a shared atmosphere that seems to make us all feel we need one path. But I've learned living with climate change is absolutely living with difference. The prismatic complexity of climate change is what makes it so challenging to address, but it also means everyone can have a role in charting a smoother human journey. I've come to see the diversity of human temperaments and societal models and environmental circumstances and skills as kind of perfect for the task at hand. You don't think of us as perfect, but in our imperfection and complexity, I think we're kind of well situated for solving this challenge uh, in a very human way. 
If we were all Greta Thunberg or Bill Gates, I think we'd be in trouble. You may resist that thought, but roll it around in your head and see what you think. Let me know. Google for the phrase, quote unquote, response diversity, and my name for some social science on this. Thomas Elmquist over in Stockholm led a group in 2003 that did a really fundamentally important paper on response diversity in ecosystems as a source of resilience. I, I contend the same is true for social systems. We need edge pushers and group huggers, faith and science, and more than anything, dialogue to find room for agreement even when there are substantial differences. At the level of nations and cultures, a diversity of approaches is also inevitable. And that's why the post-Paris shift in climate diplomacy away from what I reported on for almost 20 years, a, a binding top-down model, a contract for climate to a flexible but critical to a flexible but credible and inclusive agreement, the Paris Agreement, and what's coming beyond it. It's perfectly human version of success. Of course, it's deeply inadequate, but as I said earlier, inadequacy is us. Finding ways to deal with that, work with it, is important. There's one other element here, and it's values and, and even love. This came up for me as a science writer in a very unusual setting at the Vatican in 2014. I was there for a meeting that set up, predated and provided a foundation for the Pope's encyclical, which came out in 2015. The encyclical in which he, by the way, stressed the importance of accommodating diversity and dialogue. So this meeting at the Vatican was on sustainable humanity, sustainable nature, our responsibility right at the core of what you're thinking about at this meeting. And there were sessions there through the days, four days, I was a discussant on everything from practical matters like food, agriculture, and the Anthropocene to existential risk, uh, Martin Rees talk. It was overwhelmingly rich and interesting and challenging. After dinner on the final evening, I turned to uh, Walter Monk, at the time, he was 96. He was a Scripps Institution oceanographer who was legendary for decades for doing leading-edge science. He played a role back in World War II in helping Allied amphibious invasions succeed by refining models for waves and storms so we could predict when would be a good day to hit the beaches. So here's this guy. He's 96. He's a physical oceanographer, a numbers person. And I said to him, after dinner, I said, what do you think it'll take for humanity to have a smooth journey in this century? And Walter, he didn't mention science or technology, carbon capture, carbon tax, fusion power, political will. He turned to me without hesitation. He said, this requires a miracle of love and unselfishness. And my hair stood on end in the most beautiful way. I was just blown away by the utterly human magic in that reply, and I wish you, I had taped it so you could hear it in his own words, but those are mine.